Three days before launch, Beijing, China, military attaché Pan Wei shifted his feet nervously. It wasn't his job to speak his mind, he was just there to help translate political orders into military ones. His direct supervisor was one of a horde of under-secretaries to the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress, headed by Chairman Zhao Lei. The only thing special about his supervisor was the access it granted Wei to some of the most senior military advisory boards, a privilege afforded him through family favors and loyalty to the Chinese Communist Party. On days like today, he wished he'd said no to his father when he demanded he join the People's Liberation Army after graduation. He wanted to be a baker, but that would shatter a long and illustrious line of service stretching back to the founding of the party. It would literally break his father's heart and Wei couldn't stand the shame he felt from his now long-dead ancestors as he considered living a simple, quiet life over service to the party. His great-grandfather had fought in the Civil War that ousted the Nationalists, and his grandfather had briefly partaken in the invasion of Vietnam in the 70s. But those threats paled in comparison to the dangerous path China had set itself upon today. The party already proclaimed victory through every propaganda outlet as the logistics for an invasion of Taiwan had been pulled together for the past eight months. But those amongst the senior-most posts in both the party and the military had their reservations. Wei was among them. Undersecretary Li Kai hung up his phone, motioning at Wei to continue with the briefing that had been interrupted by the emergency phone call. Wei went through the motions, readiness reports, some sabotage to the rail networks outside of Shanghai. That one had gotten the public's attention as a train full of PLA recruits had derailed, killing dozens and injuring hundreds. He wondered if it would be remembered as the first shot in the coming Sino-American War, though he knew it was Taiwanese agents who'd carried out the sabotage. If the war was victorious, the party would simply rewrite history, spin the sabotage not as an act of desperate and preemptive resistance by a nation absolutely dwarfed in military power, but one of the laundry list of imaginary and half-real provocations that they'd invent to justify the invasion of Taiwan and forceful reunification. Wei, speak freely. Forget those nonsense reports. Tell me what's on your mind. Undersecretary Li Kai broke Wei's internal musings. History, sir. History? Wei nodded. On December 4, 1941, a Japanese strike force was just over a thousand kilometers from Pearl Harbor. Japan was convinced the swift and overwhelming violence would knock the U.S. out of the Pacific. The Americans had no appetite for casualties, they told themselves. Undersecretary Kai steepled his fingers in front of him as he leaned his elbows on his desk. Some would consider your words seditious, Wei, especially on the eve of such a momentous occasion for the party, for China. Wei nodded grimly. I always value your honesty, though, and I'm grateful for it. Unfortunately, far larger forces than us are at work. The board has been set. It's on us to make the first and winning move. Wei searched under Secretary Kai's face. Did he share Wei's doubts? Even voicing them to a subordinate like him could destroy Kai's political career. The party had eyes and ears across the length and breadth of both the government and the military. Wei had only spoken up because he'd grown to trust Kai as a good, reasonable man, a little less zealous about the party than most of his compatriots. But did Kai share his doubts? Wei searched the man's face and found nothing. Three days before launch, 48,000 feet above the Pacific Ocean, 112 miles north of Taiwan, U.S. Air Force Captain Les Manahan wheeled the big plane so that the sun was on his port side. The big RC-135 rivet joint aircraft responded nicely to his touch, and somewhere in the back of the aircraft, the electronic warfare and intelligence specialists a big plane housed were poring over the data they'd been collecting since arriving on station minutes ago. Now he put his plane into a racetrack pattern just north of Taiwan, and God willing, that'd be that. But before we follow our pilot any further, we want to thank the sponsor of today's video, Private Internet Access, the world's most transparent VPN provider. Boasting over 30 million downloads, PIA truly stands for User Privacy. It hides your IP address and keeps your digital life cloaked, shielding it from prying eyes, whether that's your ISP, network admins, or even the government. Using the internet without PIA is like showering in a room with no door. Everyone can hear your bad singing skills. PIA has also proven its no-logs policy in court battles and with an external audit from none other than Deloitte, one of the biggest and most trusted accounting firms in the world. But PIA isn't just about protection, it's also about giving you freedom. Whether you're in Shanghai, London, or New York, it makes all major streaming services accessible, with its servers located in 84 countries and in every U.S. state. Also, PIA VPN is one of the few VPNs that supports P2P file sharing, giving you even more access to content. PIA runs seamlessly across platforms – Windows, Mac OS, Android, Linux, iOS, and many others. With a single subscription, you can protect an unlimited number of devices simultaneously. 
But hold on, it gets even better. We have a special offer for our viewers. Just go to PIAVPN.com slash Geopolitico and get an 83% discount on private internet access. And if that didn't convince you yet, subscribing to private internet access is completely risk-free. They have a 30-day money-back guarantee. And if you ever need help, their 24-7 customer support is ready and waiting. So go try private internet access right now. After all, your privacy deserves no less. Now back to the skies above the Pacific Ocean, where an immediate alert from one of his flight officers shattered U.S. Air Force Captain Les Manahan's illusion that today would be a simple, straightforward mission. Manahan sighed. He hadn't expected anything less, but he was hoping maybe, just maybe, this flight could be different. You'd think the Chinese would get tired of wasting jet fuel after months of that particular cat and mouse game. The Air Force had been flying its big electronic eavesdroppers all along the Chinese coast since the nation had begun a buildup of its amphibious forces. Just a few hundred miles away, a Japanese AWACS had relieved its American counterpart, and he knew for a fact at least one more rivet joint was flying its own racetrack pattern just off Chinese territorial waters east of Henan. Together, the two aircraft could sniff out all manner of electronic signals for hundreds of miles around them, and their synthetic aperture radar provided accurate location data on Chinese hardware down to a classified resolution. It was very good resolution, though. Manahan knew. He'd flown this particular aircraft on the Black Sea in support of Ukraine, with the Ukrainian liaison on board, whose entire job had been to relay a steady stream of information to Ukrainian military command on the vast amounts of intelligence the rivet joint scooped up from Russian-held territory. In a way, Captain Manahan was a fighter ace. At least he considered himself one. He might not have pulled the trigger himself, but it was his aircraft that sniffed out multiple incoming Russian attack aircraft, warning the Ukrainians who promptly shot them out of the sky. Maybe when they landed back in Okinawa, he'd have one of the maintenance guys stencil some Russian MiGs onto the side of his cockpit. Right now, though, he had other MiGs to worry about, or at least Chinese copies of them. Sure enough, just under a minute later came the call over the open radio channel. American aircraft, you have entered Chinese air identification and defense zone. Turn around immediately and do not return. Well, this guy was more professional than the last two had been, at least, when he'd simply been told to get out or we shoot. Chinese patrol, this is an American aircraft conducting a routine flight in support of lawful freedom of navigation maneuvers over international waters and in international airspace. I request that you continue to operate in a professional conduct and maintain a safe distance from our aircraft. He knew the script by heart after months of these intercepts, though that last part had been tacked on after a Chinese fighter had tried to do a close pass to intimidate the Americans and nearly collided. American aircraft, you have been warned. Exit immediately to safe airspace and leave territory of the People's Republic of China. At least the Chinese pilot sounded as bored as he did, so Manahan was pretty sure he wouldn't get shot down today. He repeated his script once more, making it clear for anyone listening and taking notes that his plane was in fact operating in international airspace. At least if he did get shot down, there'd be a recording somewhere showing that it was the Chinese who shot first. He hoped that they'd edit the screams of him and his crew plummeting to their deaths out of it, though. Manahan knew that somewhere out there it was either a flight of Raptors or F-35s, but without speaking to the geeks in the back, he had no idea if they were in range to help. Besides, the Chinese still had a longer reach in the sky thanks to their PL-15 air-to-air missiles, outranging the US by about two dozen or so miles. They could very well shoot the Chinese fighters down, but Manahan would still bite the bullet. The Chinese did not, in fact, shoot though. Instead, they fell into a mirror patrol about 50 miles off his port. Unless they were ready to shoot, there was really nothing the Chinese could do to stop the world's best electronic intelligence spy plane. The rivet joint used a whole host of systems to scoop up vast amounts of information from the busy Chinese coast. Even at this distance, it'd be able to listen in on radio transmissions and allegedly cell phone calls placed by Chinese soldiers and sailors. He wasn't completely sure of his plane's own full capabilities. The United States kept its secrets very close to its chest, and just because it trusted him to bust their techies around didn't mean it trusted him enough to tell him how his own plane really worked. All he really knew was that he'd rather be flying back over the Black Sea, where the risk of direct U.S. involvement was minimal. Here, in the Pacific, everyone knew what was coming. Ten hours later, Captain Manahan turned his plane for home, only to get redirected to a waiting tanker. He wouldn't be landing on Okinawa after all. Instead, he'd be going to the Japanese mainland. If he was a betting man, he'd bet that it'd only be a quick refueling stop before going even further east, toward Konis, just like the hundreds of other American aircraft and ships had been doing over the last two weeks. That meant only one thing. Someone, somewhere, had figured out that the shooting was about to start. Two days before launch, Sea of Japan, 172 miles north of JMSDF, 
Maizuru Air Base. I'm telling you, it's a dead whale. Matsumoto Hiroshi shouted at his curious partner from the wheelhouse of the small 60-foot fishing vessel. On the front deck, Okano Toshiaki and two other crew shone flashlights into the early morning darkness of the sea. No, it's different. It's there, straight ahead. Go slow. Okano shouted excitedly, pointing dead ahead. Sure enough, Matsumoto could see what the much younger Okano's sharp eyes had spotted ten minutes ago. Visible, as it crested on the ocean swells and caught the moonlight, was a large dark shape seemingly bobbing around the surface. I'm warning you, it's a whale carcass. You don't want to get too close to that thing. Full of gas. It can explode. Okano waved off his captain's warning. It's not a whale. I think it's salvage. Matsumoto silenced the continued warning he was about to issue. Salvage. Now that was interesting. And potentially worth something. Fishing these days hadn't been what it used to be, with fish stocks collapsing in the Sea of Japan. If he was lucky, maybe it'd be military, something the Japanese Self-Defense Maritime Force had accidentally dropped off the back of a ship, maybe. Go a little starboard. A little more. There. Slow and stop. Keep us here. The small fishing boat pulled up alongside something. It was dark, deep blue metal, oblong-shaped, bobbing along the surface. On the back of it was a small propeller. Masamoto felt alarm shoot through his body. Hey, Okano, I'm pulling us away. It's a North Korean submarine. Masamoto was almost pushing the throttle forward when Okano's next word stopped him. No, don't be stupid. We're too far from North Korea for such a small submarine. I think it's a drone. Hey, young one, you remember to speak to your elders with respect. But Matsumoto's warning was lost on the impulsive Okano. He was already hooking a large spiked pole to a small purchase point he spotted on the hull of the strange craft. Whatever annoyance he felt that the young fisherman was quickly lost, he was a good boy, just a bit wild like most of the children of his generation. And besides, if this really was a drone, it was probably American, and they might be willing to compensate them richly for its recovery. Over the course of a few minutes, Okano and the two deckhands managed to secure the large drone to the side of the boat. It was just under half as long as their own vessel, oblong with a rounded nose and a single small propeller in the rear. The sea was calm enough that Okano could actually hop onto the top of it to take a closer look. From the wheelhouse, Matsumoto yelled out fresh warnings. Hey, you be careful, and don't damage anything or fall overboard. I don't want to get it from your mother. Okano waved off the old man as usual. Relax, Grandpa, I'm just taking a look. There's a panel here, I think. Maybe I can open it. He tried to open what appeared to be a rather large access panel, but it wouldn't budge, so he called out to the deckhands to bring him the large flathead screwdriver that they kept in the tool locker to work on the ship's old motor. Don't damage it. Maybe the Americans will pay us for their drone, but not if you break it. But Okano was too busy working at the panel to listen to the old captain, inserting the flathead into the small space between the hull of the drone and the access door. He started pushing with all his might. I think it's giving. Maybe there's writing. We can find out who it... Two days before launch. Joint Base Pearl Harbor, Hickam, Hawaii, Pacific Fleet Headquarters. There was one single knock on the frame of the door to Commander Mason Evans' office, interrupting the commander's meeting with two junior officers. Evan could see from the look on the lieutenant's face that he was on important business. The young lieutenant had just been assigned to Pack Fleet HQ and had the nervous energy of a very small fish in a very large pond full of even bigger fish. Go ahead, Commander Evan ordered, but the lieutenant shuffled uncomfortably for a moment before brandishing a carefully folded paper. Eyes only, sir. The two subordinates didn't need any further prompting. They swiftly stood and bid the commander goodbye as he motioned the lieutenant into his office, taking the paper from the nervous young man. Usually, he'd get any important news over a secure landline. He found this whole return to hand-delivered messages archaic. But the Chinese had proven to be adept at infiltrating the Navy's communication network. And while he was pretty confident in the comsec of Pack Fleet HQ, he had to admit it was a good policy to limit risk. He opened the folded paper and read it once, then read it again. Then he folded it again and fed it to a small box within arm's reach of his desk. The box whirred as it fed itself the paper and gave off a slight hum as the paper was promptly incinerated. Did you read it? No, of course not, but I was there when it came in. I mean, I know what's on it, sir. Remember ComSec, don't go about changing your plans all of a sudden, but you can probably guess you shouldn't be making any big plans for the weekend. The lieutenant nodded, dismissed. With a smart about face, the lieutenant turned and exited the office, closing the door behind him by habit. Commander Evans was quick out the door himself though, nodding past his secretary, who'd ensured the office door locked electronically behind him. He found Rear Admiral Coriolis in the dining facility, arriving just as Captain Sage Hensley, head of Pack Fleet Intelligence, made her own appearance. Deputy Commander of the United States Pacific Fleet Corey Ellis was having lunch with a group of enlisted personnel as he usually did, much to the delight of the sailors and airmen. 
It was a great morale boost to rub shoulders with the second in charge made you feel seen, but it could also be nerve-wracking experiences for some of the fresh recruits. Admiral Ellis spotted his two subordinates swiftly moving his way and dismissed his breakfast group, leaving the table empty as Evan and Captain Hensley arrived to sit. Well, nobody's called me on my cell phone, so I know the war hasn't started yet. The Admiral was savoring the last of a fat-free strawberry yogurt. Why was the modern Navy at war with all fat, he mused. Evan could hardly tell Hensley was slightly annoyed he'd beat her to the Admiral. She was one of the most cutthroat officers he'd ever met, and cherished all the face time she could get with those immediately responsible for her next promotion. But she was also incredibly efficient. Evan was grateful she was on his side of this potential war. Japanese fishing vessel sunk just north of Maizuru. Its captain got off a distress call before the ship went under. Search and rescue still underway, but it's been a few hours. Prospects not good. At the mention of the Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Force Base, the Admiral's eyebrows shot up. The two had his complete and full attention. Captain Hensley edged in. Our JMSDF partners relayed that before losing contact, the captain said they'd recovered a large object. Space Force confirmed thermal event approximately 147 nauticals north of Mazuru. We clued the Japanese in on the location. The Admiral licked his spoon clean. Could it be a mine? Evan let Hensley take the lead. If there were Chinese mines being deployed in the Sea of Japan, she'd be the one to know. Negative. We had Chinese boats on the hydros. The Montana's been on look and see duty and found nothing that their tails missed so far, though they'd be unlikely to. Neither Evan nor Hensley were old enough to remember the Cold War Navy, but Ellis had been a young ensign back then toward the end, and his father had been a submariner before him. He used to regale him with stories of tailing Soviet subs for weeks on end. The Ruski is clueless to the 360 feet of silent death lurking just a few hundred meters behind them. The Chinese were proving similarly easy to track for America's new Virginia class, but were making frightful progress, mostly by stealing NATO tech secrets. Suggestions on what it could have been? Likely a suicide drone. I'm guessing the boat either ran into it, it malfunctioned, or it was compromised by the crew somehow. We don't know, unless the Japanese can get to the survivors, and that's unlikely. Evan could swear he saw the professional mask Hensley wore 24-7 slip for just a moment. All intelligence types wore their masks. It was their job to deliver and safeguard information that could win or lose wars, but hers had slipped. What had he seen underneath, though? Fear? Apprehension? Anticipation? He wasn't sure. The Admiral nodded. I'll notify the old man. Needless to say, I would advise your staff to not make any weekend plans. If China was truly deploying suicide drones that close to Japanese naval bases, then the war was almost on. And in a way, that was a relief. After nearly a year of build-up, negotiations, counter-negotiations, posturing, and preparing, it was happening. There would only be one victor, because neither side could afford a compromise. For both the US and China, it was all on the line. If China failed in its invasion of Taiwan or was defeated by the United States, the Chinese Communist Party would surely fall. If the United States was defeated, it would be pushed out of the West Pacific for the foreseeable future, maybe forever completely upending the global status quo. This one was for all the marbles. Commander Evans should have been afraid, but instead he was just damn relieved that the insufferable wait was finally over. 18 hours before launch, National Reconnaissance Office HQ, Chantilly, Virginia. A group of technicians huddled over a large LCD display set into a table in the middle of the imaging analysis lab buried deep in the basement of the NRO's sprawling HQ. From here, imaging data from a fleet of orbiting satellites was fed to over 100 technicians who used advanced AI algorithms to pour over the millions of images generated every day and look for the tiniest discrepancies between each. It was similar to the way that astronomers looked for new planets or large comets in the early days, pouring over dozens of photographic plates to look for the transient dots of light that might only move millimeters from plate to plate. But the NRO's AI algorithms were tracking ships, airplanes, sometimes even individual vehicles. It was a painstaking job that used to take dozens of man hours to accomplish, and even then could never achieve the speed and precision that AI made possible. Now the display showed a military airfield in Anqing in southwest Anhui province, but no AI algorithm was needed to spot the difference between the photos snapped by orbiting reconnaissance satellites just six hours apart. All 24 of the airbase's H-6 bombers were missing. In an incredible feat of logistics, the Chinese had managed to fuel and presumably arm 24 intercontinental bombers and launch them before the next overflight of an American spy satellite. The call had already been made to the U.S. National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. Eight hours before launch, ten miles offshore Agatu Island, Duan Jingguo eyed the men working the research vessel's crane warily. He distrusted them, but especially the one in charge, the big muscle-bound man who'd spoke maybe five words the entire time they'd been on the ship. It was clear they were government men, doing a very bad job of pretending to be research scientists like the rest of Jingguo and his crew. 
Jin Kuo had no choice but to accept the men on board. The government had funded his study of the Arctic beluga whale population that frequently transited through the Alaskan Aleutian Islands, where they found themselves currently. The funding had been a surprise to Jin Guo, not least of all because the study was being conducted in cooperation with American biologists. China and the US had little reason to collaborate nowadays. The three obvious government men and their mysterious payload, now being craned out over the side of the ship, had not been a part of the deal. He wasn't surprised. The military frequently funded endeavors such as this that it considered dual use or of scientific and national defense value. But beluga whales? Now he knew. They just needed a way to get close to the American Aleutian Islands to drop off this whatever it was. Jing Guo frowned. He didn't like this cloak and dagger stuff. He disliked the tensions between his nation and America, which made his working relationship with American biologists on board strained even more. He just wanted to study his whales. The senior government man cursed as the crane swung its payload back in toward the ship as a particularly high wave struck it. The big black box was about 4 meters long, maybe a meter wide and a meter thick. It had been stashed on the rear deck of the ship for the entire voyage, and everyone had been under strict instructions not to tamper with it. Jing Guo had been forced to make up a story to the three American scientists about their current diversion. The plan had been to try to catch up with the beluga pods moving through the Aleutian chain, and the ship had been given clearance by the US government, though upon arriving in their territorial waters, a US Coast Guard cutter had been an ever-present companion. Given the tensions between the two nations, Jing Guo wasn't surprised. At least if the ship ran into trouble, help wouldn't be too far away. And speaking of the Americans, where in the world were those three biologists? With a final stream of profanities, the government goons finally managed to move their payload into position just over the water's edge. The rear crane was disengaged, allowing one end of the strange box to fall into the sea. Almost immediately, the top end, still secured by its own crane, deployed a series of airbags. Jing Guo raised an eyebrow. He presumed they were meant to be sinking what he thought must be some sort of secret underwater sensor or something. But this was meant to… float? The front crane disengaged and the box fell into the sea, bobbing up and down as its top end remained above the waves. The government man, the big one in charge, immediately yelled for everyone to get away from the side of the ship. Watching from his perch outside the main cabin on the upper deck, Jing Guo was bemused. What in the world? What? Then there was a loud hiss, followed by a metallic pop and twin simultaneous roars as two columns of flames shot up into the sky. Mouth agape, Jing Guo followed the fiery path of what he couldn't know was a specially modified land attack cruise missile. The specially modified CJ-10s had been significantly reduced in weight and length, given that they only needed to travel about three dozen miles to their target. This also allowed them to be secretly inside a metal deployment box and stored aboard a ship without raising the suspicion a full-size 7-plus meter missile might. 3,000 feet into the sky, the missiles engaged their seekers and then immediately plummeted to just two dozen feet off the waves. The maneuver was meant to help them evade air defenses, but it was completely unnecessary. The Americans had no deployed ground-based air defenses at the target site. Locking onto the powerful emissions of the massive L-band phased array radar situated at Ericsson Air Station on an island 30 miles away, the missile screamed over the waves, crossing the distance in about a minute and a half. They both struck the massive radar array, missing center mass by about half a meter, one immediately after the other. Each 600-pound warhead was more than enough to destroy the target. But the Chinese military wasn't taking any chances. Back on the ship, Jing Guo had been tracking the smoky flight path of the missiles in the chilling near-zero air, then gasped at the telltale flash of twin explosions in the far distance illuminating off the low-hanging cloud cover. By instinct, he turned to swing his binoculars around on the American Coast Guard cutter about three miles off their starboard, settling on the big 57mm cannon on the front of the ship. The burly government man grunted as he made his way up the stepladder to the ship's upper deck, then briskly addressed the stunned Jing Guo as he removed his cell phone from his pocket, snapped it in two, and threw it overboard. Contact the American ship and surrender before they blow us to pieces. Also, you might want to release the Americans from their restraints before you do. You'll find them locked in their berths. Two hours before launch, Beijing, China. Pan Wei exited on the rooftop of the government building, spotting the undersecretary sitting on a chair next to what appeared to be a folding table next to him. Li Kai beckoned him over, motioning at a second chair. Kai offered him a beer from the cooler seated atop the table. Wei hesitated. It was late, but technically he was still on duty. Technically, both he and the undersecretary were still on duty. As if reading his mind, Undersecretary Kai waved off his concerns. Come, sit, have a beer. Wei sat, reaching for a beer but holding it uncomfortably without opening it. Kai reached over and opened it for him, pressing it back into the man's hands. It's okay, our duty's done. Everything that happens from here, well, we've done our job. Slowly, Wei sipped the beer. It tasted like ash in his mouth, but he didn't say anything. 
We're lucky it's a clear sky tonight, almost no smog. Can you believe it? In Beijing? The undersecretary laughed. A casual glance at the floor next to his feet revealed that this was in fact not his first beer, nor his second. Sir, do you think… Shh, hush now. No more thinking. Any minute now. I spoke to a Plarf major. He assured me we'd see at least some of the launches from the batteries in Zhangbei if the skies were clear. Quite the light show, he promised. On cue, a column of light appeared in the distant horizon, then another and another, then a dozen more. The fiery plumes reached up into the skies, filling the unusually clear night with massive plumes of smoke which refracted the light. There were so many of them that it was almost like a miniature sunrise. Look, my boy, watch. The heavens announced the end of our century of humiliation. Undersecretary Kai exclaimed loudly, drunkenly. Wei sat in silence, watching until the last of the fiery plumes faded. The undersecretary mirrored his silence, then angrily tossed his half-full beer can over the side of the building. Thirty-five minutes before launch, 30,000 feet above the Pacific, 618 miles northwest of Hawaii. The E-2C swung north to expand its patrol pattern to better match the evasive maneuvers being undertaken by the USS Nimitz, a hundred miles southeast of their position. The big carrier was at full military power and easily outrunning its escorts, putting on an astonishing burst of speed to make it a much harder target for the Chinese ballistic missile barrage that had already laid waste to so many Pacific Fleet ships. Two of the Nimitz's escorts had already been sunk, another was dead in the water. The Navy had been forced to choose between rescue efforts or keeping its fleet moving to make them harder for the Chinese missiles to find them as they pounced down from space. It had opted to keep its surviving ships moving. The E-2 aircraft was on its own mission, though, and its radar operator had his eyes glued on his display. The surprise attack on the Ericsson radar array had created a massive gap in the US's radar coverage of the Pacific, and it didn't take a genius to figure out what was coming next. Taking out Ericsson had created a gap through the Aleutian Corridor, but the Chinese hadn't struck at any of the mainland Alaskan or Canadian radars. That meant only one thing. They didn't want the Americans to see what was coming south through the Aleutians. And if you went south far enough from the Aleutians, well, that only left Hawaii, home to the US Navy and Air Force's most important Pacific bases. The 24 missing H-6 bombers now made sense to U.S. intelligence. The Chinese had clearly flown them north with permission from Russia, refueling over Russian territory before swinging southeast, timing their entry into range of Ericsson Array just after its destruction. Now the Nimitz had dual duty, evade the ongoing Chinese ballistic missile barrage, and try to plug the massive hole torn open in North Pacific radar coverage. The latter was impossible, but its E-2s could at least cover the most likely northern approach to Hawaii. A half hour later, the radar operator spotted the returns that could only come from the big Chinese bombers. Bogey, heading 342, Angels 41, make that 3. Nope, that's it, we got him. Range 361 miles, making 641 knots. The air traffic controller didn't wait for confirmation. She was already on the radio with the loitering cap. Flight Viper, be aware, bogeys on bearing 042 from your position. Range 421 nauticals. The Nimitz had put up three combat air patrols. All three just happened to be in the wrong position. But F-18s were fast when they wanted to be, and fuel was no concern. On his plot, the radar operator could already see Viper flight wheeling and turning on a heading to the incoming Chinese bombers. The two-ship flight quickly accelerated to 1,200 miles per hour, as the other two caps wheeled on the Chinese as well. The Super Hornets were in full murder configuration, and within minutes more would join them from the carrier, each carrying 10 AIM-120s, but the air-to-air -air missiles had a range of just about 87 nautical miles. Armed with the new generation air-to-ground cruise missiles, the Chinese H-6s only needed to get within 500 nautical miles of Hawaii to launch their ordnance. It's unlikely many of the bombers would make it home, but it was just as unlikely the American aircraft would take out more than half the flight before they released their deadly payloads. Hawaii would suffer a second Pearl Harbor, just as devastating as the first. Suddenly, in the distant horizon, there was a bright flash of light. The crew of the E-2 shielded their eyes as the light penetrated even deep into the belly of the plane from the front windows. As a wave of electronic noise smashed into the aircraft's sensitive gear and briefly all their displays went haywire. But the E-2 had been built for a nuclear battlefield, and within moments the technicians were back in control. Viper Flight hadn't been so lucky. Their assigned patrol route had been along the very eastern patrol edge of the Nimitz's ever-shifting position as the aircraft carrier sped along. This put them about 430 miles northwest of Hawaii and at the very edge of the nuclear explosion. One hour after launch, White House. 
There was a rare break in the hectic noise and activity of the underground operations center. From here, the President of the United States had monitored the ongoing war in the Pacific. Now about 19 hours old, in as real time as the US military's communication networks could manage. Under constant electronic attack and with a great deal of Pacific infrastructure destroyed on the ground by Chinese missiles, there were significant blank spots in the US military's awareness. The Space Force Major was keenly aware of the two dozen eyes now resting on him, including the wartime leader of the free world. Mr. President, the Chinese seem to be targeting all of our orbital assets except our space-based surveillance network. There have been no further launches from no nuclear complexes inside mainland China. I believe, Mr. President, that the Chinese are sending a message by leaving our early warning satellites untouched. They are not wishing to escalate to a nuclear exchange. The Secretary of Defense growled into his coffee as a goddamned warning, a message, stay out of the Pacific, out of Taiwan or else. The Secretary of the Navy leaned in toward the President, a murderous look in her eyes. Mr. President, with all due respect, this nation has never responded to nuclear blackmail, and this was not a victimless display of resolve. They nuked two of my aviators, along with thousands of sailors and airmen already dead across the Pacific. She quivered in barely restrained rage. The look on the face of the Secretary of the Air Force mirrored her fierce anger, though his face remained set in stony silence. The President of the United States leaned forward in his chair. I want my Air Force back in the Pacific. Let me know as soon as Okinawa and the Japanese can launch planes. I want ships being sunk in the strait within 72 hours. Want more wartime stories? Check out I Survived 100 Days of World War III, or click this other video instead.